Hi, this is Jenny Langley, author of the new Maudsley Training Manual. Um, and in this video, we're looking at exercise 2.4 on hypermetabolism. Um, and all of the exercises within this module two are designed to help carers have a better understanding um, for the challenges of recovery um, and the complexity. Um, and this one is all about the weight gain and the effect that hypermetabolism can have on that. OK, so metabolism is basically um, how much energy your body needs. So it's all the chemical processes going on inside your body that keep you alive. Um, and most people understand that um, if you go on a crash diet, then your metabolism starts to slow down um, and you're likely to move, lose um, muscle. Um, and for that reason as well, you need less um, calories on a daily basis. So your, your metabolism basically gets slower and slower the more you go on crash diets. Um, and that's quite widely understood. So when carers are asked, you know, what do you know about metabolism? They normally say, well, we just know that if you go on a crash diet, then it's likely to slow down. Um, and it's true to say that um, people with anorexia, when they're in, in that starved state, their metabolism is likely to be quite slow before they start on their refeeding progress um, process. OK, hypermetabolism is when you get an abnormal increase in the body's um, basal metabolic rate. So your metabolism really speeds up. Um, it can occur for various reasons. So it might be there's been a significant injury um, or multiple traumas to the body. So it might be surgery, it might be long bone fractures, it might be infections, it might be sepsis, burns, um, steroid therapy, bone marrow transplants. All of these things can cause um, hypermetabolism where your metabolism really Feeds, um, speeds up. It also can occur um, when you start refeeding after a period of starvation. So with anorexia pay patients, um, when they start to get treatment, they start on their refeeding program, they can find that very, very quickly um, they need to eat more calories than they thought that they would have to. And it can be quite confusing. So lots of carers get very confused. They quite often come to the workshops and they say, we can't understand it. My son or daughter is having 2,000 or 2,500 calories a day. They're sticking to the meal plan, um, but they're not um, experiencing the desired um, increase in body weight. So maybe it's only 70 or 80 percent of what we would expect it. And that can cause a problem because carers can then start to think, oh, is my loved one cheating? Are they over exercising? Are they purging? Are they hiding food um, or engaging in some sort of activity, which is actually reducing the amount of um, food that's being absorbed? Um, and that can be very frustrating, of course, for the sufferer who is sticking to the meal plan and not able to gain the required amount of weight. OK, so let's have a think about how a healthy person is different from somebody then on a refeeding programme. So if we have a healthy 15 year old female who weighs 50 kilograms, who has a moderate activity level, then maybe she needs to eat about 2000 calories a day. So that would equate to 40 calories per kilo of body weight per day. OK, if she wanted to put on a kilo, then she would need to consume an extra 7000 calories. Um, calories so over a week that would be an extra thousand calories a day and um, so that so that would be three thousand calories a day so that would equate to 60 calories per kilo per day so that's a healthy person for somebody who's recovering from anorexia so same 15 year old who maybe weighs 50 kilos but her target weight range is 53 to 55 kilos so she's still um, needing to gain that extra weight so her base requirement might still be 2000 um, but then you need to add um, a thousand calories for her to gain a kilo a week, so three thousand. Then, if she's experiencing this hypermetabolism, um, which can be anything between ten and thirty percent above the um, original level of your basal metabolic rate, um, then you might have to factor in um, a factor of one point two, which would give you three thousand six hundred calories, or one point three, which would give you three thousand nine hundred calories. So that now is up to seventy eight calories per kilo per day. So you can see quickly how these big numbers um, on refeeding plans come about. OK, the first time we um, recognised hypermetabolism was back in the 1940s. So a psychologist called Ansel Keys was looking at the effect of star starvation um, after the war. So there was mass famine across Europe. Um, and they did a study in Minnesota where they had 33 healthy young volunteers. So they hadn't been in the war, so they were psychologically fit and they were physically fit when they went into the study. And the study was designed that they would lose about a kilo a week for 10 weeks. and um, 
they all, you know, they all really stuck to the programme. Um, they lost the weight and then, of course, they wanted to reverse and put the weight back on. Um, and they were really surprised to find that the men didn't put on anything like the um, amount of weight they thought they would. So an extra thousand calories a day wasn't leading to a gain of a kilo a week. It was leading to more like um, 700 grams or 800 grams or something like that. So that was the first time we actually in a, in a, in a research study um, saw that evidence that that hypermetabolism is a process that can happen with free feeding. A more recent example, um, which you may remember, was when the illusionist David Blaine went into his glass box um, by Tower Bridge in London and he um, basically starved for uh, 44 days, I think it was, um, and basically obviously lost a huge amount of weight. Now, he was being medically monitored by King's College Hospital um, and so they um, also measured his basal me metabolic rate and saw how much it increased through that refeeding phase. So before he went into the box, he weighed 96 kilos um, and his BMR was just over 2,000. Um, on day zero of refeeding, so when he came out of the box, he weighed 71 and a half kilos, so he'd lost a huge amount of weight um, and his BMR had dropped, as you would expect, um, to about 1,700. By day five of refeeding, you could see that the BMR was starting to pick up a little bit. By day 46, um, his basal met metabolic rate had gone up to over 2,300, so significantly higher than it was at the beginning of the experiment. Then they kept measuring his BMR um, over the next few months, and it wasn't until day 236 that they that they saw that the metabolism had settled back down to a more normal um, level for a man of his stature. Um, so it can take three to six months for that hypermetabolism to reverse and slow back down. So when you're on a refeeding program and then you're looking at weight maintenance, um, it really is trial and error to see how many calories do I need, first of all, to gain the weight, and then how many calories do I need to maintain that weight. Um, and that is affected by your metabolic rate as well as activity levels and that sort of thing. Okay, the first time um, I was informed or, or found out about this hypermetabolism was at a conference in London in 2007, and there were two very experienced dietitians, specialist dietitians, um, and they explained really clearly. And we'd never had it explained when my son was ill, so that was back in 2002, and so we were always astonished at how much extra food he had to eat to first of all gain the weight and then maintain his weight level. So they explained that in the inpatient setting at the Phoenix Centre in Cambridge, um, generally with the young patients, they would start with a dietary intake of about 1,200 calories, and then they would gradually increase that up to um, a level of about 3,000 calories. Then they would add in more snacks. And typically with the um, young teenage patients, the meal plans would rise to between 3,200 to 4,000 calories. Um, so obviously that's, that's you know, quite a lot of calories. OK, on weight maintenance, so once target weight range had been achieved, they also had observed that the calorie requirements can remain elevated. And they said for between a further six and 12 months. Um, and that's because of the hypermetabolism. Um, and then gradually, gradually, the calories would be tapered back down um, in stages um, to adjust the, as, as the metabolism came back down. Um, but again, it's quite trial and error. But, but they were basically saying we have to take into account that hypermetabolism. OK, so how did they work out how many calories were needed? So this is calculation. So they had a formula for, for females aged between 10 and 17 years. So 13.4 times the weight plus one six plus, sorry, 692. Or you can use a thing called the Harris Benedict cal calculator, which you can Google um, and put in the, the weight and age and everything. And it will come up with the same similar sort of number. Then you need to factor in um, an, a, a, an uplift for activity. So they would factor 1.4 for light activity, 1.5 for medium activity and 1.6 for high activity. And they actually gave the patients a choice of like which programme do you want to follow? If you want to go for the higher activity programme, then you will obviously be on a higher calorie um, diet. Um, and they found that that work, worked really well because some patients were really, really frustrated and disillusioned if they weren't allowed to do any activity. Then they added in a, a 100 calories for growth um, and then they added in the uplift for hypermetabolism. So between 10 to 30 percent uplift on that. OK, so let's have a look at a young person um, at the start of treatment. So again, a 15 year old female, she's coming into treatment. She weighs 35 kilos. So um, under their calculation, her BMR would be 1161. Then they're going to act, multiply by the activity factor. So let's assume for the first few weeks that this young person will be 
pretty sedentary, not really doing much at all, maybe on bed rest. Um, so we don't need to uplift for activity to start with. Then we add in the 100 calories a day for growth. So it gets to 1261. Then add in 500 calories, assuming that she's um, aiming to gain half a kilo a week. Um, and then at the moment, let's assume her metabolism has, hasn't started to increase just yet. So you wouldn't factor in an uplift for metabolism in those first maybe couple of weeks. So she would on she would start on about 1700 calories um, and then you would start to see that increase and that equates to about 50 calories per kilo per day. Now assuming that that same patient wanted to or, or was required to gain a kilo a week in the inpatient setting then you would be adding a thousand calories rather than 500 calories for the weight gain and so that would equate to 2261 calories in total which is about 65 calories per kilo per day. Okay so that's at the start of treatment. Now let's have a look at that same patient. So let's assume she's gained a kilo a week for 10 weeks. So she now weighs 45 kilograms. So applying the same equation that the Phoenix use, then you get to 1295. Now she's active, so she's chosen to be moderately active in her programme. So you have to add an activity factor of 1.5. Then you add the 100 calories for growth. Then you add the 1000 calories a day for the weight gain being a kilo a week. So you're up to 3000 calories and then you add in a factor for increased metabolism. So let's consider in this case that it's 1.2. So that gets her up to 3651, which is about 80 calories per kilo per day. So you can see that very quickly, the numbers increase in terms of the required um, calories per kilo per day to carry on with that weight gain. This is an interesting article that was posted in 2014 and it's got a really useful chart that shows exactly what we've just been talking about. So there's a patient who enters treatment weighing 37 kilograms. By mid-January, that, that patient needs 40 calories per kilo per day to gain a kilo a week, so she would be on 1600 calories a day. And by the end of February, that patient needs much, much more, so 85 calories per kilo per day. So a patient weighing 50 kilograms at that stage would need um, just over 4,000 calories a day. So exactly the same process that we just went through, but this article gives a really neat chart that sort of shows the um, the average sort of um, increase in calories that we see through that treatment program. And again, in this um, article, it said, yes, the metabolism appears to normalise about three to six months following weight restoration. But of course, it is trial and error. OK, so let's have a look at a 12 year old boy um, on discharge from his inpatient treatment. So he still needs to gain about half a kilo a week. So let's assume he weighs 40 kilograms. So this is very similar to my son. So using Harris Benedict, we'd come up with a figure just under 1,300. Let's assume he's highly active. So he's come out of inpatient back in the community, wanting to play football or sport of some sort. So we could apply an activity factor of about 1.7, then the 100 calories for growth, then 500 calories for weight gain based on half a kilo a week, and then um, a factor of 1.3 for increased metabolism. So for this young lad, he would need about 3,600 calories, um, equating to 90 calories per kilo per day. That's very similar to our son. Um, and in fact, this is our son. So it started off at 1,200. By the end of week two, he was on 2,000 calories. At discharge from inpatient, he was between three and a half to 4,000 calories. Then he was much more active. So we were having to um, try to get him to eat 4,000 to 4,500. And he did because he was motivated by his sport. Um, and then his weight at discharge from outpatient was 44 kilograms. And he continued to have that high level of um, food intake of between four and four and a half thousand calories a day for the foreseeable future um, as he was doing more and more exercise and his um, metabolism gradually started to slow down. And then within six months, he was basically taking responsibility, listening to his body. OK, this is a more recent case in Germany um, and a slightly older patient, a 19 year old girl. So this was reported in 2018. Um, start of inpatient treatment, she weighed 45 kilograms. Um, she reported that it was really, really hard for her to um, gain weight. So she needed to eat a huge amount. She couldn't really understand why. Um, and she was not engaging in any of the avoidance strategies we talked about. So no, no hiding food or vomiting or laxatives or anything like that. Um, so her meal plan was quickly increased up to 4,000 calories a day um, and her peak intake through that inpatient treatment was 5,000 calories a day um, and her weight at discharge was 55 kilograms. And because she was obviously experiencing a high level of hypermetabolism, um, it was recommended that she carried on having specific nutrition counselling after discharge to meet her continued energy requirements. 
Okay, so I hope through this exercise we've helped you to understand the importance of taking into account the, the hypermetabolism through weight gain. So for some patients it might not be huge, it might be 10% uplift, for other patients it might be 30% uplift, um, and it really is trial and error to try and work out how much um, calories are needed to continue that weight gain. Um, if the young person's not gaining weight, then either they're cheating or they need more calories. Okay, um, the important thing for carers is to be really supportive through this process, um, provide um, calm atmosphere around meal times, lots of support, acknowledging the challenges, um, and then it makes it much easier for, for everyone to get through that difficult period. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. It was a bit longer than the others because it's quite an important and complex subject. Um, all of the worksheets and the accompanying videos can be found at www.newmaudsleycarers-kent.co.uk. Thank you.